Back in the early 1990s, way before I was even thinking of starting Australia's first Islamic superannuation fund, I was 22, studying law and driving a taxi. I hope they're not filming that. <laughs> I was already thinking about buying my first home, and I did. Fast forward 30 years, and my 22-year-old daughter, studying law, certainly not driving a taxi, and here in the audience today, is locked out of every housing market in every major city in Australia. And house prices? Oh my God. In 1990, when I was 22, the median price of a house in Sydney was $185,000. Fast forward to 2023, it's $1.2 million. Let that sink in. $1.2 million. And then you think about the median income. The median income in Australia in 2023 is $65,000 or $1,250 a week. So when you put those two figures together, 1.2 million for the median price of a home and $65,000 for the median wage, well, only 0.1% of you can afford to comfortably buy a home. 0.1%. So that means you, madam, and you, sir, are the only people here that can buy a home. And what do I mean by comfortably? Well, I mean paying the mortgage and not starving. More technically, I mean not paying more than 30% of your pre-tax income toward your monthly mortgage payment. Otherwise, there's this thing called mortgage distress, where you simply cannot operate. Now, I think we need a bit of this. <laughs> Have you got any tablets for me? Okay. The next question is, what is the situation on a national level in Australia? Well, I described the Sydney level to you, but on Australian, from an Australian national perspective, the figure is slightly better at 18.3%. So what that means is only, if you're on a median wage, only 18.3% of Aussies can comfortably afford to buy a home. Now I'm repeating these figures very carefully because they talk to the adversity of the situation and it's not getting better any time soon. The great Australian dream is fast turning into a nightmare, which is not going to end any time soon. And so, I guess the question is why? Why is this happening? Why do we have an affordability crisis that's occurred in the last 20 years that only seems to get worse, and it's actually predicted to get even worse still, given, given the supply and demand of properties? So let's talk about what the major reason is for it. Well, first of all, we all know supply and demand are the biggest reason. We simply do not have enough properties and well-located land in Australia for everybody who wants one. And that is a major problem. But we've got government policies on a state and federal level. We've tried all kinds of things. We've tried to build new houses, new properties, new units. Still hasn't solved the problem. But leaving aside demand and supply, for one moment. What about our banking system? What role does it play in creating or fueling this housing affordability crisis? Well, I would argue it plays a fundamental role and we should reimagine part of our banking system to be human-centered, fairer and easier to access. And on that basis, when you wanna reimagine what you can do for banking, there's got to be a way where perhaps there's no interest. 
think about it. A bank does not charge interest, fleece its borrowers, kick you out of your home after 90 days of not paying. Well, there is such a place and such a system. And I can tell you it's in over 50 countries operating already. And that dreamlike place where banking institutions are not your enemy but your friend can be found. What is this utopia, you ask? Well, it's Islamic finance. Islamic finance is based on partnership, alignment of interest, shared responsibilities, and is very much human-centred. It is based on the belief that we're trying to get people into their home, not about lending you money and using in that home, only as security if you do not pay the loan back. Fundamentally, that is the problem. The other problem that I'll mention is that, which Islamic finance actually responds to, is that under our current system, we cannot share the economic or capital gain or return on the property price that are ever increasing. A bank simply lends you money, uses the property as security, but it has no interest in the property. If we were able to reimagine a system that does that, then we would be in a human-centered approach. Now I ask you a couple of questions. You might think, well, that's great, mate, but I'm not Muslim. It is for Muslim and Islam and all those mob. Well, the answer is you don't have to be a Muslim. In fact, globally in the global financial market, Islamic finance is one of the highest growing sectors at 4.1 trillion, I want to say that carefully, 4.1 trillion in 2021, scheduled to grow by at least 50% in 2026. And the majority of investors in Islamic finance are not Muslim. They simply like the ethics, the transparency, and the practice, and of course, the outcomes, the return, because they're investors after all. What if I tell you that it's not only in 50 countries, but Islamic finance is not only in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, i.e. Malaysia, Indonesia, etc., even though it does exist there. What if I told you that Islamic finance already exists in Singapore, South Africa, Luxembourg, and the UK? All these Western jurisdictions have made the changes to their rules to allow Islamic finance to thrive and are reaping the benefit. Even King Charles approves. <laughs> I'm not kidding, he actually really supports Islamic finance. So, what is Islamic finance? What is this thing we're talking about? Well, Islamic finance is based on the Islamic law tenets of the Holy Quran, or simply the rules in the Muslim equivalent of the Bible, the Holy Quran. It has three main tenets. Number one, money has no value within itself. Money is only a representative value of goods and services. Number two, money should not make money, if you believe in number one. All interest, re giving and receiving should be avoided. And number three, investment and activities in harmful industries should be avoided. So no investment in tobacco, armaments, pornography, alcohol, banks and insurance companies, anything that gives or take interest. These are the principles of Islamic finance and it supports a partnership-like system where the buyer and the, the, the borrower and the banking institution have a partnership. And you might say, well, that's great, mate. That really sounds really awesome. So well, how does it actually work? Tell me. So let me put it in the plainest of English that I can and differentiate that against what we have today. You go, to a pro, uh, you go and buy a house, you go to an Islamic banking or financing institution and you buy a property for a million dollars. The bank puts in 800,000 or the institution and you put in 200,000. You're with me at the moment? Unlike traditional setups, 
you're actually a partnership with the banking institution. They own 80% and you own 20%. You move into the property and you jointly own the property and you happen to own 20% of it. You move into the property and you pay rent to the bank. You also pay down the principal or equity over a period of time. And as you pay it down, you own more and more and more of the property. So it's a shared equity principle. Let's say in 10 years' time, you decide to sell the property and you sell it for $2 million. The loan is $600,000, so you've made a profit of what? After paying back the bank, $1.4 million, you divide it in half with the banking institution. It's a partnership. What does that mean and why is that important? Well, it encourages responsible lending. It discourages excessive risk-taking by the banks. So where they just look at the, your property and say, oh, look, whether you can borrow or not, I'm just going to satisfy the regulators, but I don't care whether you can borrow or not because I'm going to sell your property and take the money back. But it also has other things, that, other principles about being human-centred and being fair, equitable and just. Now, you may say, why hasn't this been done in Australia before? Well, there's been many reports recommending it, like the UK. It will, it's not present now, it will take two to three years, but it can happen and it can be a solution to the housing affordability crisis, or at least part of it. The three main barriers as I see them is one, stamp duty. We need to abolish stamp duty. State governments would hate that, don't clap. State governments would hate that, but it would be good for the customer. Because as you move the ownership of property from one to the other, you need to pay stamp duty. Number two, bank valuations. All of a sudden, it's no desktop thing where I just see what the property is. If I can get 50% of it because I'm going to sell it and I don't care what I sell it for, if you don't pay me, it's your partnership. You really look at it because you own 80% of it to start with. And number three, the legal and uh, regulatory issues about changing you know, parts of the credit code and making other simple changes that will allow the banking model to start. So, if I can leave you with one takeaway today, that would be to get curious about Islamic finance and imagine a world where we can embrace a human-centred approach to get more Australians into houses quickly, and also to give current and future generations of Aussies the ability to live the Aussie dream that we all deserve. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.